Hi everyone, so this PowerPoint is for plate tectonics. And so for the learning objectives, um, we are looking at this enduring understanding, Earth's systems interact, resulting in a state of balance over time. Now, personally, I do have a little bit of an issue with that term balance. Um, Earth systems do create balance over time. However, um, between periods of balance, there is often periods of uh, change. Uh, the learning objective, um, describe the geological changes and events that occur at convergent, divergent, and transform plate boundaries. So we're really looking at those plate boundaries. And as a result of this, um, some of this may be a little bit of a review for some of you um, if you have taken any earth science classes in the past. We'll discuss all of this essential knowledge um, at the end, so hang on for that. As usual, I'm going to skip the vocab, but you guys can pause this and jot down the vocab. Now, I'm going to start this off with a quote. This is from Dr. Peter Ward um, from his book Gorgon. And this is talking about, the book is talking about the end Permian mass extinction event. So the quote reads All other fields of study use the intervals of time known to us all seconds, minutes, hours, days, and so on. Geologists, on the other hand, talk about periods and epochs, eras and zones, stages and series, the arcane subdivisions of what is known as the geologic time scale. All are defined by death. The bigger the division, the greater the body count. For geologists, death becomes the ticking of the geological clock. And in a sense, this is what uh, Dr. Ward was talking about. Uh, this is the geologic time scale where he's talking about eras. We have four eras, the Cenozoic, the Mesozoic, the Paleozoic, and the Precambrian. And I should mention that you guys do not need to know any of these divisions. Um, what I really want to impress on you in this um, in this slide is the sense of time. So we're talking about time in millions of years before the present. So as you go further and further down and into the separate columns, you're looking at further um, the age of the earth and million years before the present. So 5 million years before the present, 10 million years before the present, 65 million years before the present. And um, going back to his quote, what he was talking about is these divisions. So every division, where you're, whether you're talking about the division of an age or the division of an epoch or the division of a period or the division um, separating a, um, an, uh, an eon, you are gonna have an extinction event. Um, death really is how they, how they distinguish between these also in a lesser sense, uh, just geological uh, strata and the rocks themselves. But at the end of the Permian was a mass extinction event, right? The end of the Mesozoic 65, 66 million years ago, an asteroid struck the earth and caused uh, the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. All of these um, divisions are caused by, um, are chronicled, I should say, by some sort of, um, some sort of extinction event. However, again, what I wanted to impress on that slide was just the um, the sense of time. And we're going to be talking about plate tectonics. We're going to be talking about continental drift. These processes occur on a very long time scale. Um, plates move at about the rate that your fingernails grow. So think about if you had not if you do not cut your fingernails for an entire year, it might be a few centimeters. Um, of growth, that's about how much how fast these plates are moving. Some plates move a little bit faster, some plates move a little bit slower. But first off, a little bit of background. You guys probably don't need to write this down, but um, before modern science in the 19th and 20th centuries, most people thought that the Earth was fixed, that all of the continents, all of the land masses, all of the islands were where they were and that they've always been in that place and that they always will be in that place. However, people did as early as the late 1500s notice that um, there were some anomalies in the map, especially Africa and South America, how they look like they fit together like two puzzle pieces. Okay, so it started people thinking that maybe these had moved in the past, but they didn't really, didn't really catch on for a while. However, if we fast forward to the early 1900s, um, German uh, geologist Alfred Wegener proposed that the continents um, once did form a large solid landmass, and he called it Pangaea, essentially meaning all of earth or all of land. And Pangaea is probably the most famous supercontinent. It is the most famous supercontinent, but it's not the first supercontinent um, that has existed on earth, nor will it be the last. It was just the most recent. Okay, he used a lot of evidence um, to support his claim. So he had fossil evidence. So there were certain species that were found on several continents. I'll show all that on the next slide, as well as geologic evidence, which I'll again show on the next slide. 
So in terms of fossil evidence, um, this is just some of the examples. There are literally dozens. Um, but for example, Lystrosaurus right here, um, there are fossils of Lystrosaurus in Africa, on the Indian subcontinent, on Madagascar, and in Antarctica. Now, how did that animal get to those different places? And there were a few different possibilities. First, it could have independently evolved on each of those land masses. Those land masses, if they were in the modern positions and the earth was fixed, they could have independently evolved on those different land masses and you could have had the same, um, essentially the same animal through convergent evolution, but that is very, very unlikely. Another explanation is that the earth is fixed and that <clears throat> this animal migrated or swam across oceans to these different continents, including Antarctica, which would be you know down here in um, the South Pole, and it would be able to survive both in equatorial Africa and Antarctica. Very unlikely. The third idea is that um, the plates themselves moved and that this animal was once able to freely roam on an entire larger continent, and then that continent um, broke up and um, moved to its present location. Now that turned out to be the correct um, hypothesis. Okay, so this is just showing some more of the evidence um, from Wegener. I'm not going to go through every one, but I do want to point out some of the geologic evidence. There are the same um, rocks essentially forming the same mountain changes, or sorry, the same mountain chains through North America into North Africa and the Iberian Peninsula, um, Spain and Portugal. And then um, the same mountain range, the same rocks forming the same mountain ranges, the same geologic um, features in North America and then in Northern Europe. But even though the Wegener's um, evidence was really convincing, he never proposed an explanation for how it worked. And without that explanation, without that mechanism for how it worked, um, there was no, it wasn't really accepted. And there was intense debate among geologists and biologists for over half a century um, for whether plate tectonics was real, whether it was actually occurring, um, and it wasn't until the 1960s that it was finally settled with some further evidence. So that further evidence um, came in the form of apparent polar wonder, uh, magnetic reversal, and radar that detected mid-oceanic ridges. We are going to talk about the mid-oceanic ridges. We're not really going to talk about radar detecting them because it's not important for the AP class. Um, and we're also not going to talk about polar wonder or magnetic reversal. They both have to do with the magnetism of rock and the um, and in the case of magnetic reversal, the way that the Earth's magnetic field reverses, but it's not important for our class, so we're not going to discuss them. So with radar detecting mid-oceanic ridges, um, radar was a new invention that came out of the World Wars. Um, you had to detect where enemy submarines were, so radar um, was the product of that. And they started to use it afterwards um, to map the seafloor, and they, they noticed as they mapped the entire seafloor, that there were these mid-oceanic ridges and that these mid-oceanic ridges pretty much um, just like they say are in the middle of ocean basins and they are mountain chains in the middle of ocean basins those are volcanic mountain ranges that will become important in a little bit when we talk about um, the types of plate boundaries and what occurs at each plate boundaries um, but you have these mid-oceanic ridges that are completely volcanic mountains and they wrap around the earth kind of like the stitches around a baseball and some different weird things happen um, in different uh, different places different continents like how they go right through the red sea we're not really going to discuss that we're not going to discuss why it looks like it dives underneath of north america um, but in general in the middle of oceans there are mid-oceanic ridges and long story short, with plate tectonics, we now know that it is occurring. We now know that there are um, seven major plates on the planet. That is the North American plate, the Eurasian plate, the African plate, the South American plate, the Australian plate, and the Antarctic plate, as well as the Pacific plate. Okay. Um, so there are those seven major plates on the planet. And then there are a dozen or so minor plates. And there's actually a lot of like dozens of tiny little, teeny tiny little plates that we're not even gonna discuss and aren't even showing up on this map. But you notice that those mid-oceanic ridges um, follow the lines of some of those plates, right? 
And that led, um, that again led evidence to the theory of plate tectonics. We now know that there is a mechanism involved, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, but the scientific community and the world at large um, takes plate tectonics um, as an accepted scientific uh, theory. So these tectonic plates, they move around the surface of the earth. They move really slowly, like I said, about the rate that your fingernails grow. And a tectonic plate is um, what we call the lithosphere. So the, the plates are made of the lithosphere. The lithosphere is the crust, what is gray on this, plus the upper portion of the mantle, the asthenosphere. Okay, so the crust, as well as this upper portion of the mantle, is going to make your, um, your lithosphere. Okay. The upper portion of the mantle is part of the lithosphere because right up there at the top of the mantle, it's cooler. It's away from the heat source. So the heat source is the core of the earth. I'm going to draw it in fire down here. So the core of the earth is the heat source and it is heating up the lower portions of the mantle. And that hot rock is less dense than cooler rock. So it's going to rise and it's going to cool as it gets towards the crust. Okay, as it gets towards the crust, again, it cools, it becomes more dense, and it starts to sink. All right, to replace that hot rock that moved up before. And you develop what is called a convection current, where you have um, the movement of a fluid due to temperature differences. It's very hot down here, very cool up here at the crust. So this hot rock down at the bottom is going to be is going to expand. It's going to be less dense, so it is going to start to rise, and it is going to push out this cool rock that's down beneath that or up above. That cool rock that's up above gets pushed down, and it replaces the hot rock that moved up because nature doesn't like a void. You can't just have a void of rock down there, and it creates um, this convection current. And at the top of those, where the um, where the the asthenosphere is, you have um, the asthenosphere is just the upper portion of the mantle, not a vocab word for this class. Um, the rock is so cool that it's almost like the consistency of tar, and that tar consistency rock can um, drag the crust with it. All right, so that lithosphere, the upper portion of the mantle, and the um, and the crust gets pulled along with the, um, with the convection current. And that's what drives um, plate tectonics, or at least that's the best explanation for what we have so far. It's convection currents and really thick, sticky, semi-molten rock up at the top of the mantle pulling on these plates. Now I mentioned that there's a couple dozen plates. Um, it's really, it's actually really d difficult to determine exactly how many plates there are because they're not something that we can actually see. What we can see, how we can see them, is through indirect evidence like volcanism and earthquake activity, um, as well as mountain ranges and other forms of of evidence. But we can't literally see the plates, so it's really difficult to tell how many there are. Um, so yeah, but in general, there are two types of plates. The two types are oceanic and continental. The oceanic rocks are primarily made of basalt. You don't really need to know that, but what you do need to know about it is that they are more dense. So the oceanic plates are more dense than the continental plates. Continental plates are primarily made out of granite, which is another volcanic rock. Both of those are volcanic rocks, um, igneous rocks. But the important thing here is that the continental plates are less dense. So when you have them striking up against each other, the more dense oceanic plate is going to dive underneath of the less dense continental plate. And that one's gonna go down and that one's just gonna ride over, okay? And then we're gonna talk about bedrock a little bit later in the class, but different bedrock types are gonna result in different soil types because the bedrock is gonna be weathered down and um, broken down to form some of the soil. So we'll talk about that on another day though. And where these two types of plates meet, um, where any types of plates meet, is known as a plate boundary. So a plate boundary is where two plates meet, and there are three basic types, um, divergent, convergent, and um, transform. Within convergent, though, there's three subtypes. So there's really like five types of plates, uh, plate boundaries.
And you guys have probably talked about plate boundaries um, before, even maybe in elementary or middle school. So you probably know uh, what they are, but um, divergent plate boundaries, this is where you have two plates and they are moving apart from one another. Now, again, nature does not like a void. So when they move apart from one another, um, what's underneath of those plates? Well, what's underneath of those plates is going to fill the gap, and that is liquid rock. So magma, lava is going to come up and um, erupt up out of this, out of this gap of the two um, the two plates, and it's going to create volcanoes. And that's what you see at a mid-oceanic ridge. Where you have those mid-oceanic ridges in the middle of the oceans, you have one plate going one direction, one plate going another direction. This might be the North American plate, this might be the Eurasian plate, and they are moving in two separate directions, and nature, again, can't have a void. You can't just have an empty space where they, um, where they separate. What's going to fill that gap is all the magma, all the lava that's underneath, all the molten rock. That molten rock is pressurized. It's carrying the weight of all of this um, crust on top of it, all of the millions and millions and millions of tons of rock on top of it. So it shoots out of here as a volcano. The same thing happens uh, when you have one of these on land. So this is um, this image is the Great Rift Valley. On the top right is the Great Rift Valley of Africa, which is actually a series of rift valleys known as the East Afri African Rift. And there's several branches of them. There's different parts. But essentially what's happening is the Somalian plate is breaking away from the African plate. So the Somalian plate is kind of going in that way direction and the African plate in this case is, I mean, I think it's moving more like that, but in whatever case they are moving apart from one another. And where they move apart from one another is creating these rift valleys and surrounding these rift valleys are mountain ranges and those are volcanic mountains because again, magma is pressurized underneath and is going to bubble up, okay? Uh, down here, finally, on the bottom right, you have um, a Colorado example. Strangely enough, we have a rift valley in Colorado, and it's the Rio Grande Rift Valley, where the North American plate tried to rip itself apart um, millions of years ago, created the Rio Grande Valley, which is where the Rio Grande River flows down, starting in the San Luis Valley uh, near Alamosa, Colorado. And um, that stopped, but you still have all of this volcanic activity on either side and is still a rift valley. All right, the next uh, class of boundaries are convergent plate boundaries. Again, there's three subtypes, and this is where two plates are moving towards one another. Okay, so we'll talk about each type individually. Okay, and the three types are based off of um, the two types of plates coming together. So in this case, we have oceanic to continental. We have one continental crust. In fact, I'm going to erase that because it's it's the same thing. This is just the diagram that I found. And you have oceanic. So continental and oceanic. All right. The oceanic plate, again, is more dense than the continental plate, which is less dense. And you should recall from either physical science or chemistry that something that is more dense is going to sink, something that is less dense is going to float on top. Um, that even pertains to rock, okay? So as these two are, uh, plates are coming together, so they're going to crash into one another, and there's going to be a lot of force there, and that force is going to start to drive one of them beneath the other one. The, it's going to drive the more dense oceanic plate underneath of the less dense continental plate, okay? Now, I'm going to back up a little bit and talk about where this oceanic uh, plate formed. This oceanic plate formed at a mid-oceanic ridge. Now, why is that important? It forms at a mid-oceanic ridge, right? This plate is going this direction, the other side is going that direction, and it's forming this volcano um, at the mid-oceanic ridge. Again, that, base, uh, the, that stream of volcanoes in the middle of the ocean. Um, when these, when the rock that forms this this um, oceanic crust is formed, it's magma that rises up from the Earth's mantle, and it cools into rock under the water. Now, when it cools into rock underwater, it's going to trap some water in that rock. Not only is it going to trap water H2O, but it's also going to trap dissolved gases that are in that water. Those dissolved gases are primarily 
oxygen gas and carbon dioxide. Okay, so this rock that makes up this oceanic crust, even though it is more dense than the continental crust, is going to have water, oxygen gas, and carbon dioxide gas trapped underneath of it, or inside of it, not underneath of it, inside of it, inside the rock itself, inside the crust itself. As this um, oceanic crust dives underneath of the uh, continental crust, the less dense continental crust, this rock that forms the crust will start to melt, right? It's nice and hot down here in the mantle, and it's going to melt that rock. When that rock melts, it's going to release those dissolved gases, water, oxygen gas, and carbon dioxide gas. All three of them are going to be gases because the water is, you know, boiling hot, so, you know, melting rock temperature, uh, so it's going to be a gas also. Those gases are very low density, so those gases are going to want to, I'll do gases in blue, those gases are going to want to rise and they're going to find any little nook and cranny and crevice in the rock and continue to rise until they reach the atmosphere. When they reach the atmosphere, the last little like bubble of rock that they got to get past is typically solid and it's going to be a volcano. That volcano will often vent gases, but it will also often release these gases very violently in a volcanic eruption. Okay, that is going to eject rock, superheated rock with it. Okay, so at a, at a continental to oceanic or oceanic to continental, either way, um, plate boundary, you're going to find a number of different things. You're going to find a subduction zone. This subduction zone is this entire area that we're talking about where this um, plate is subducting underneath the other one. Okay, you're going to find a trench. You may notice that right there is a trench okay let me do that one in black right there is a trench that trench is a very low place in the ocean compared to everywhere else around it and it's due to the angle of these two um th th of these two plates right this one is going down this one is kind of like bull nosed or snub nosed and moving over and it's creating this area right here that is very deep and is a trench Okay, the most famous trench on the planet is probably the Marianas Trench, um, the most the deepest place um, in the ocean. You don't really need to know trenches for the class, but I just want to mention it because it is one of the features that you find, and you may see it on a test or a quiz, but very unlikely. You're always going to find earthquakes wherever you have a plate boundary, so there's going to be earthquakes. All of these uh, pink dots are earthquakes; those are surface quakes, as well as some deep quakes, I guess. And then you're going to find volcanoes, okay? You're, those volcanoes are going to make mountains. They're going to make um, volcanic islands. And, a vol and, and those volcanic islands are called a volcanic arc. Okay? So let me erase that. It's all getting very messy. Um, but you're going to find a volcanic arc. I'll show you what a, pic a picture of those um, in a second. All right? So the reason that you have those volcanoes, again, is because of these dissolved gases in the rock. Okay, so an example of um, where this occurs is on either side of the ring of fire. The ring of fire um, is a more or less complete ring, kind of horseshoe shaped around the Pacific Ocean, where you have a volcanic arc of, of volcanic islands, a uh, volcanic archipelago, um, another volcanic archipelago of Indonesia, Malaysia, um, and the Philippines, um, volcanic arc of Japan, volcanic arc of the Aleutian Islands, all of those are volcanic arcs. All of those are volcanic archipelagos. It's essentially a string of volcanic islands. If we just look up here at the Aleutian, at the Aleutian Islands, you have the North American plate up here. You have the Pacific plate down here. Pacific plate's going that way um, and crashing into the North American plate. And as it does so, you get earthquakes all along this line but you also have lots of volcanism. There's a lot of underwater volcanoes here that haven't formed um, islands yet, but once they, reach, once they breach the surface of the ocean, they form a, re or a chain of islands, which is a volcanic archipelago or a volcanic arc. Same thing with the islands of Japan, all volcanic, uh, the islands of the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, um, New Zealand, and all of the isolated islands of the South Pacific. Right, the second class of continent, um, 
sorry, convergent plate boundaries is continental to continental when two continental plates meet. Now these are going to be more or less equal density. So you have continent A and continent B coming together. They're both continental. They're both equal density. And because of that, re ignore what they sh say down here, but we're just going to have them come up to each other and there's no place else for them to move. So it's just like crumpling a Coke can and they are going to go up and form mountains. So there's, they're not really going to subduct much. Don't worry about that part right there. Um, just know that they come together and as they come together, they go up and form mountain ranges. Okay. The important thing here is that they are non-volcanic mountains, okay, non-volcanic. Uh, there is no subduction, there's no dissolved gases um, in the rock, and they are not uh, melting, so it's not going to form volcanoes. It's just going to form um, straight non-volcanic mountains. The Himalayas are the best example, and the Himalayas were formed as the Indian, um, as the Indian plate, the Indian landmass um, went north. Very, very, very fast in terms of plate tectonics. Um, it only took, what, uh, 60 million years for it to move that distance. That's pretty fast in terms of plate tectonics. The Eurasian plate was pretty much flat all down here until the Indian plate came up to it and it crunched up against it. And just like a car collision, you're going to have a lot of crumpling. And that crumpling is forming all of these mountain ranges um, in the western part of the Middle East, um, in North India, the Tibetan Plateau, um, and in Southeast Asia. And then the last type of convergent plate boundaries is oceanic to oceanic. I'm going to pretty much skip this because it's all of the same stuff that you see in oceanic and continental. You get all of the same stuff. You get subduction zones, trenches, vol um, earthquakes, volcanoes, and volcanic arcs. And here is more of a close-up picture of Alaska. Our last one is the tra is transform fault boundaries. So transform faults happen when two plates are moving um, anti-parallel to one another. Anti-parallel meaning that they're parallel, but one of them is moving that direction and one of them is moving that direction. Okay, this is going to re result in an earthquake and what we call a fault line. This is an example of a fault line. I'll do that in a different color. Let's say purple. This is a fault line right there. This is the San Andreas fault, which is probably the most famous fault. Um, at least for us in North America, because it's right in California. Um, so in California, you have um, the North American plate, and then you have the uh, Pacific plate. And it's really weird to think that you could literally be straddling this um, this line, this fault, and have one feet, uh, one foot on one plate and one foot on another. All right, but um, the reason that this picture looks so weird is that you have a river, so you have a couple drainage basins forming a larger river, and that river used to just flow straight. However, because this plate is moving in that direction, it has shifted the river that way. Now, this is actually a dry riverbed, um, but it's it's still a river. All right. One thing that I hope that you noticed um, with all of three of our plate boundaries, including all the subtypes of uh, convergent plate boundaries, is that they all result in earthquakes. Earthquake maps are one of the best ways to uh, to map where um, where uh, plate boundaries are. So you can literally just trace a line if you have enough earthquakes to show where all of the plate boundaries on the world are, and you can map the plates that way. All right. Um, we don't really need to do that. I do want to point out that there is a lot of cities that are in earthquake prone areas, um, but there and there is also earthquakes that are kind of isolated, um, not at plate boundaries, but more or less um, you can you can map where a plate boundary is by where the earthquakes are. Now, in earthquakes, uh, they occur at um, plate boundaries or fault lines. We're not really going to talk about fault lines except for transform fault boundaries, um, but they happen due to the movement of the earth at either a fault or a plate boundary. Now, how an earthquake occurs is due to what we call stick and slip motion, or at least how most earthquakes occur is due to stick and slip motion. What that is, is basically, um, I think it's best to explain this using an analogy. So imagine that you have a door and that door is just a little bit too tight in the door jam. You pull on the doorknob and it doesn't open. 
You pull on the doorknob a little bit more, it doesn't open. You pull on the door button, doorknob a little bit more, and it doesn't open. Finally, you just yank on that doorknob, and it finally opens with a loud bane, and it releases all of the pent-up um, energy that was in that door, releases it all, um, and some of that you can hear as that bane. Now, the same thing is basically happening at a plate boundary. This is a... Um, this is a diagram of an oceanic to continental convergent plate boundary. And what you have is the continental crust, which I'll mark C, and the oceanic crust O moving in opposite directions towards one another. But they're not going to ride smoothly. There's really not much lubrication. There's, they're not smooth. It's not like you're moving two sheets of ice. You're moving two sheets of rock. And rock has, is very complex three-dimensionally. There's lots of cragginess, and they're going to grip one another, and they're going to get stuck. And they get stuck, and they get stuck, and the plates are pushing and pushing and pushing against each other, and they're stuck, and they're stuck, and they're pushing up against each other more and more, and eventually that force overcomes um, the friction and they release. They can release so much that these land masses um, can visibly move and that's how you get an earthquake. Now, if they release a little bit of energy, it's a minor earthquake. If they release a lot of energy and these two plates really spring um, either up or down, then it's going to be a severe earthquake and cause a lot of damage. Speaking of which, um, the earthquakes are uh, measured by the Richter scale. The Richter scale is named after the person that um, came up with the scale. It's, it's a logarithmic scale, meaning that for every jump and magnification, it's a um, tenfold increase in severity. All right, so this shows some of the most severe earthquakes um, on the planet that we've um, since since recording began, and then the minor earthquake, some of the minor earthquakes as well, or at least their analogs. There, it should be noted that there is like millions of very minor earthquakes every year, and then every year there is potentially one or two, maybe zero major earthquakes. Now I'm going to do a quick sidetrack here to tsunamis. Um, many tsunamis do occur due to earthquakes. Tsunamis are not in the AP learning objectives. However, there's something that we're going to talk about throughout the course, and um, you will possibly see them on an AP question. So what is a tsunami? A tsunami is um, the, it's, it's a Japanese term for a tidal wave, but it's not a tidal wave. Tidal waves occur um, due to the tides, whereas a tsunami occurs due to some disturbance um, in the ocean or under the ocean. And one of the major region, reasons is due to earthquakes. So say that you have, again, a oceanic to continental plate boundary, and you have an earthquake occur in that. And this is a major earthquake. So this continental crust was like um, so jammed up against that oceanic crust that it was even bent backwards. And once it releases, it springboards forward. And then the oceanic crust springboards underneath. That's going to displace a lot of water, a whole lot of water. Um, that displacement of water is going to create a ripple, and a ripple is a wave. So this is a you know, large series of waves, large series of ripples. And it's going to create a wave which has a characteristic rolling motion. However, once it gets to the land, it can't, it's the, 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 the amount of roll, this um, circle is going to remain the same. However, there's not a deep ocean there for it to go into, so it's going to go up into the air and crash down as a tsunami. Often very destructive for coastal communities. So again, how they happen, you're going to have some sort of disturbance underwater. That could be a large volcanic eruption. It could be an earthquake. It could be a very large landslide that's going to displace a lot of water. And again, you're going to have this rolling motion of the wave that forms. All waves have a rolling motion, um, a circular motion. And when it's in the deep ocean, that doesn't really matter because it's just going to be a minor, small little wave. But that same amount of water displacement, that same amount of wave, once it gets to the, the continent, has no deep, um, deep area to go into. And it's going to instead go up into the air and it's going to crash down as a really large wave. 
and again, often a very destructive wave. Okay. And one final thing that I should point out about tsunamis, um, even though we went to the next slide, is that tsunamis can occur um, if you have an earthquake in one region of the world, say that you have an earthquake off the coast of Japan, you can have a tsunami that travels throughout the entire um, the entire Pacific Ocean Basin, where it will go from Japan and wash up on Hawaii and then wash up on California later. It will have diminished a lot by then, so it won't, like if there's an earthquake off the coast of Japan, like the 2011 earthquake uh, that led to the Fukushima Daiichi uh, nuclear um, accident, um, it's going to be a major uh, tsunami right there off the coast of Japan because it's so close. But as it gets further and further and further away, maybe all the way down to the coast of South America, it's going to be a relatively smaller, uh, much, much, much smaller because it's going to be, it's going to diminish energy over time. Now, volcanoes. Uh, where do volcanoes occur? Question mark. Um, volcanoes occur most often at convergent oceanic to continental or oceanic to oceanic plate boundaries or divergent plate boundaries. Again, in divergent plate boundaries, that's what's being shown right here um, on this diagram. You have this plate going that way, that plate going that way, they're diverging from one another, and you have all of this liquid rock welling up in the middle that is erupting as a volcano, mid-oceanic ridge, and it could possibly um, get so large that it forms an island. But where you also have volcanoes occurring over here, where you have this subduction zone um, cre releasing those dissolved gases bubbling up as volcanoes. Now, where you also can have volcanoes is at a hot spot. A hot spot is not at a divergent plate boundary, it's just in the middle of a plate. Um, Hawaii is a great example of a hot spot, and right in the middle of the Pacific plate. It's where there's a mantle plume, so there's this um, there's this overheated area of magma in the mantle, and for some reason this portion of the mantle is is hotter than everywhere else, and it wells up and just like a pimple, bursts up the surface um, and erupts and um, forms a volcano. That volcano grows and grows and grows over time until it eventually forms an island as it breaches the surface of the ocean. So it can occur in the middle of an oceanic plate. It can occur in the middle of a continental plate. So we have Yellowstone as probably the most famous North American example. And then it can happen right at a plate boundary such as Iceland. Now there's um, quite a few different types of volcanoes. We don't need to go into all the types. Um, and there's, but within those, there's two basic types of eruptions. One of those is a non-explosive eruption. You do not need to know the term effusive, so don't worry about that, just non-explosive. Um, and really, we just need to know the effects of it. This is like picture Hawaii and the volcano just bubbling out lava very slowly over time. Um, if you can walk, you can outrun this, um, this lava in many cases. Not in all cases, but um, just giving you an idea that it, it occurs very slowly, but it's going to be destructive because nothing stops lava. Um, what this is going to do is create new land and it's going to create disturbances uh, where there was previously land. And both of those lead to secession, ecological secession, which you may have talked about in biology, but we'll talk about later in the school year. And then we have explosive eruptions. These are the more dangerous eruptions because um, not only are they releasing volcanic ash and cinder and gases up into the atmosphere, um, to potentially rain down and cause um, lung damage and um, respiratory uh, damage, but they can also create pyroclastic flows. And a pyroclastic flow is where you have this avalanche of cinder and volcanic ash just hurtling down the mountainside, and it's very, it can go as fast as a jetliner. So it's very, very fast moving and very, very dangerous for the people that live there. However, um, many people do live at the base of these types of volcanoes because they create very fertile soils. These um, volcanic ashes, these volcanic cinders, um, are great in terms of soil. They bring up um, some rare minerals from uh, deep in the earth, and they, those minerals are necessary for plant growth. Okay, So they create very fertile soils. Many people around the world um, have have lived at the base of volcanoes for thousands of years and continue to do so despite the um, the danger, which really isn't much danger if you monitor the volcano. Um, but uh, they, they live there because the agriculture is really good because they create fertile soils. 
They also create disturbances and new land for secession, but what I want to highlight especially is fertile soils. And then finally, a little bit about climate. How volcanic eruptions can um, affect the climate. Volcanoes can release a few different types of um, gases. Now they can release carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that warms the planet. We will talk about that later, um, but it warms the planet as a whole. If you have lots and lots and lots of volcanic activity, you can release so much carbon dioxide that global temperatures, average global temperatures are going to increase. Um, I should just say right now that that is not what we are seeing at the present. There is not nearly enough volcanic activity um, for our, rise, our current rise in CO2 to be um, due to volcanism. What I want to focus on here now is these sulfate aerosols and any aerosols in general. This could be also ash, volcanic ash, and volcanic cinders. Okay, Volcanic ash and volcanic cinders are not sulfate aerosols, but they are released by the, um, by the volcano up into the upper atmosphere. Uh, the sulfate aerosols are sulfur um, dioxide, which can turn into uh, sulfuric acid when it reacts with water. Those sulfate aerosols um, reflect sunlight. So they reflect sunlight back into space and they cool the planet because they're reflecting that energy back into space and not allowing that energy to get down to um, the lower atmosphere, the troposphere, the ground level. Okay, so they um, bounce sunlight back into space. That has a cooling effect. And that cooling effect um, is a short-term cooling effect. Carbon dioxide is long-term warming, but sulfate aerosols are short-term cooling. When I say short-term, I'm talking one or two years, maybe five years max. Um, a couple examples of that, and, and what's really cool is, before we get to examples, is what's really cool is that these ashes and sulfate aerosols can get up into the upper atmosphere, the upper troposphere and the lower stratosphere, and they can become globally distributed pretty quickly um, just by global wind patterns, um, especially if it's a volcano near the equator, anywhere in the tropics, it can become, these can become globally distributed really quickly. So a Volcano in Indonesia, like Mount Tambora in 1816, could have worldwide effects. You could have what they called a year without the, without a summer, where in North America you had uh, crop failure because there was snowstorms in June and July. Same thing in Europe, crop failure, massive famine because of snow in the middle of the summer. Um, you also saw um, famine in um, China and uh, Japan and in the um, Central and South America. So it's called the year without a summer, again, because it was so cool in the summer and in the temperate latitudes of um, Europe and North America, you had snowstorms in June or July. In 1783, you had the eruption of the Lockheed Fissure in Iceland, which again led to famines, basically a year without a summer, except that's not what this one's called. Um, you had famines and plagues in Japan and North America. You had um, famine in Europe. And the famine um, in France especially was linked to or as one contributing factor for the French Revolution. So they have socio-political um, implications as well. All right. Everything does depend on climate in the end. All right, and I'll basically skip this slide, um, tectonic plates and global climate. Um, the earth is not static, the continents do move, but we'll talk about the effects of that on another day. So just wrapping up with the learning objectives, um, again, the enduring understanding, there is that one, um, that one kind of term that I, part of it that I don't particularly like, there is lots of change and change is imbalance, but between times of change, there is balance. Okay, there's often great change in Earth's history. Um, we talked about convergent, divergent, and transformed plate boundaries. We talked about the geologic changes and events that happen at each, the, um, the features that happen at, at each as well. We talked about convergent plate boundaries and how they create um, volcanic mountains, those volcanic island arcs, earthquakes, and again volcanoes. Um, this is important to note that when I said all of that, I was really referring to oceanic to continental. Continental to continental um, um, convergent plate boundaries are just going to be non-volcanic mountains.
plus earthquakes because earthquakes are at every um, are at every uh, plate boundary. All right. Divergent plate boundaries um, occur when they're in the ocean. Um, Seafloor spreading, you have a mid-oceanic ridge. If it's on land, you have a rift valley. In either case, you're going to have volcanoes and earthquakes. Transform plate boundaries only have earthquakes, no mountain building, no volcanoes, just earthquakes. Okay. Um, we showed a couple maps that show the global distribution of those plate boundaries. Again, what I would think of is that one with the earthquakes, the one with the red and yellow dots. Um, we can see those to determine the location of volcanoes, island arcs, earthquakes, hotspots, and fault lines. Again, you don't really need to know faults all that much, um, really at all. And then finally, we talked about how earthquakes are formed. Um, in the term of stick and slip motion. So you have all of this stress when things are stuck. And then finally, it's going to there's going to be enough pressure to overcome that stress. And it's going to release all that pent up potential energy in the form of motion. And that motion is an earthquake. Cool. Well, I hope you learned something. And thanks for sticking with me. Bye.